Welcome everyone to the Trails for Us, How Trails Benefit Our Local Communities webinar. We're really glad you're here today. Um, we've set this webinar up in meeting format so that folks can have a Zoom face-to-face -face conversation in the final portion of this webinar. But we know it's uh, lunch hour for, for many folks. And so during the presentation, part um, if you need to turn your camera off um, that's fine or you're also welcome to keep it on um, it's always nice for presenters to have a sense of of talking to some some humans out there um, and but if folks can take care to remain muted during the presentation part um, and and then we can unmute as needed for discussion at the end um, we're glad you're here today. Um, the Oregon Trails Coalition is excited to partner with Michelle Archie of the Harbinger Consultancy for today's webinar. In terms of Trails Coalition news, um, wanted to let folks know that our call for proposals for our big Oregon Outdoor Recreation and Trails Summit in October is coming to a close at the end of this month. Um, so I will share the link to our summit website in the chat. It will be October 27th through 29th on Mount Hood. Um, registration will open up this July. Um, but in the meantime, we would love your great ideas for session proposals or projects that you would like to share at the summit. And that is the main coalition news I wanted to share today. Um, we are recording today's webinar and plan to make the link available on the Oregon Trails Coalition blog. So if you want to return to anything in today's webinar or share it with a colleague, we will email out that link on Monday. And want to invite folks, if you have a question at any time during Michelle's presentation, we invite you to share that in the chat. Um, we anticipate the presentation to probably take uh, between 30 and 40 minutes and then have a good 20 minutes or so at the end for Q&A and discussion. Folks who are on the line might also have, have experiences to share um, that can enrich our group discussion. And so with that, I'll say welcome, Michelle, and I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Steph. Can you hear me? Sound great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming today. I appreciate you taking some time to spend talking about this uh, topic, about how trails benefit local communities and how we can talk about this in ways that have some uh, firepower behind them. Um, so a little bit about me, I, um, you can read this and if you're super curious, you can look on my LinkedIn profile. I mostly wanted to say that I've been doing community and economic development work with uh, mostly rural communities and some with larger communities, but uh, really around this intersection of uh, outdoor recreation, heritage and economic development for about 30 years, we often find that using economic data, economic information, uh, creates a space for people to talk to each other in ways that maybe have become difficult before. So a lot of times land managers, for example, and uh, gateway communities don't have the best relationships. Sometimes using economic data can just kind of create a little bit of a shared table that uh, creates some new questions about how we can work together for the benefit of communities and landscapes, trails, et cetera. So, um, I do co-chair the National Geotourism Council, so I have a fair bit of background, both professionally and in that role, with uh, place-based tourism. But that is not what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, when Steph and I talked about this webinar, we wanted to focus on um, trails, values, for local communities. So how trails benefit our communities is really what we want to focus on. And yes, economic value is really important. And by that, I mean what most people refer to when they come, especially, this is changing a little bit now. I think our, 
understanding, kind of a, the breadth of understanding about how many different economic arguments we can make for something like trails is really growing. But still, I think a lot of times when clients approach us, for example, when they say economic report, they mean an economic impact study, which really means looking at the economic impact of visitors on our communities or our states, regions, et cetera. Um, but especially in the wake of the pandemic, I think that visitors, but this has just accelerated a process that's been happening for a long time, that the number and behavior of visitors can be kind of a touchy subject. And really, there's so much more to the benefits of trails than just talking about the jobs and income and sales for businesses that come when we attract other people to our community. So that's what we really want to focus on today. I'm going to just take a really simple approach to this today. I could be here all day, probably part of tomorrow as well, talking about everything that I think is interesting about this topic. But today we're just going to look at three different kinds of community benefits and outline some ways that you can demonstrate these for your own trails and your own communities. So the first is that trails contribute to quality of life. This is more and more kind of uh, mainstream talking points, but it's interesting to dig around behind that and to figure out how we can talk about that in ways that are rooted in some analysis and some study and some data. So research does suggest that there is sort of a predictable relationship between amenities, quality of life, and economic performance, especially in rural areas, but this is not entirely confined to rural areas. These um, same sort of values of amenities can be seen in other more complex, bigger economies too. So in economists speak, an amenity is just something that enhances a location as a place of residence or a place to do business. So the thing to understand about amenities, and if you think about this a little bit, I think you can come up with some examples of how this is true. So amenities are place specific. In other words, your place has a particular basket of amenities that might be similar to what other places have, but there's no place quite like your place. So amenities are really place specific and they're really difficult usually to restore if you destroy them. Think clean water, once you mess that up, it's kind of hard to get it back. Um, open space, once you mess that up, it's kind of hard to get it back. So today I just wanna focus on three baskets of amenities that I think are particularly important for trail communities to consider. Natural amenities, so things like I was just talking about scenic beauty, open spaces, trails, and other outdoor recreation, access, clean air, clean water, wildlife, all of that sort of thing. Pretty easy to think about what those are. Another set of amenities that's a little bit squishier, but that gets talked about a lot when you ask people why they live where they live or what they like about their community are these things that fall into this basket of rural community character. So these are, it's a good place to raise a family. I feel safe here. It's a small town atmosphere. Um, I feel like there's kind of a community feeling here. And in some small towns, that's sort of a, there's a community feeling, but we don't get into each other's business too much. So we kind of leave each other alone too. So this whole kind of feeling of what it's like to live in a rural community is by itself an important amenity. Um, a lot of times people, people will sort of shorthand this like small friendly communities. So the friendly part of it, it's an important part of that basket. And then culture and heritage. So that's, Arts and culture, we kind of think about arts and creative sec sectors, but also traditions, uh, what kind of economic base your, historic, your community historically has, how that might carry through what your community looks like, your downtown looks like. And then in this basket, also all of these opportunities for education and engagement. So thinking about these amenities, they are economically important in six basic ways. 
six ways that we're going to talk about today. First, that I like to talk about, because I think this gets missed a lot um, in research, but it's really important. It's pretty easy to document. So it's business attraction. So the same reasons that you and I like to live in the places that we choose to live, if we can choose to live where we want to live, are reasons that business owners rake highly as reasons for them to do business where they do business. So this is this is the same for longtime business owners that is, as it is for new business owners. So when you ask business owners in these kind of higher amenity areas, these places that have good access to the outdoors, that have this kind of rural character, natural environment, all these kinds of amenities, they will say fairly well, always in something like this order, scenic beauty, uh, clean air and clean water, so environmental quality, good place to raise a family, I wanted to live in a rural setting, and small town atmosphere. Um, more and more we're seeing outdoor recreation rise to the top in surveys like these. This is surveys from 1995, and the mix of amenities has shifted a little bit in more recent surveys to really include outdoor recreation. I'll show you about that in a minute. So this is just a survey of business owners in three counties north of Yellowstone National Park. Headwaters Economics has done some pretty interesting research, and if you haven't poked around on their website, I, I just suggest doing that for a lot of insight into how recreation is influencing community performance, especially economic performance and population change. And so if you just look at population growth, there's a significant correlation between a concentration of outdoor recreation opportunities and more and more outdoor recreation economy and the attractiveness of an area. In other words, more people moving in them moving out. Now, I absolutely understand that this can also be a double-edged sword, but I welcome you to just remember how hard it is <laughs> to steer a boat with no water under it. If you're losing population, that's a bad equation, especially for rural communities. So just this difference in rural communities alone that recreation counties are gaining population and non-recreation counties are losing population is something to um, at least consider as a potential benefit. Loyalty and place attachment and support for land protection. And I would say by extension, also some support for trail construction. So if people like living there because they appreciate these amenities and they care about their place, what, what I have found in our work is that these places that uh, kind of garner a lot of loyalty on the part of their residents also tend to um, express more support for land conservation, open space protection and so forth. And that as contentious as that is sometimes, if you look at the popularity of open space uh, programs and open space bonds at state and county levels, typically, I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to say every one of them is without its controversies, um, but that's one way that people express their loyalty or their attachment to the place. And interestingly, I've, I've seen one study that differentiated between the uh, amenities that were most attractive to newer residents and the ones that were most attractive to longtime resident residents. And newer residents tended to value those natural attributes and outdoor recreation more highly. And longtime residents tend to um, like kind of that uh, traditional thread or that historic and cultural thread in their community, that link from the past to the future. Um, two final reasons why these kinds of amenity, amenities are important is um, that they are often at the root of community and economic development strategies. And especially, I put this um, rural prosperity through the arts and creative sector, there was this um, 
maybe 10 or 12 years where creative placemaking and and arts and creative sector economic development was kind of the rage among state agencies and state administrations. And I think outdoor recreation is stepping into that role now. I think that there's a new focus that's very similar to what we saw, say, from the mid 1990s through, well, maybe the maybe around 2000 through the mid, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago was this sort of big uh, growth and popularity of arts and creative sector at, um, recreate, I'm sorry, economic development. And I, I think that's getting replaced a little bit by a focus on outdoor recreation. And then direct economic impact. So festivals and events, um, destination outdoor recreation areas, trail networks, cultural organizations, business incubators, all of that kind of stuff all have direct economic impact. So these are six ways that that basket of amenities are directly economically important in our communities. So the old adage used to be that people follow jobs. So wherever the jobs were located, people would move, but it is now at least equally true, if not more true that jobs follow, follow people. Um, so I wanna talk just for a minute about a study that was recently done about people moving to Montana communities. And by the way, I'm from Montana and um, I, let's see, I went to school, I went to um, undergrad at Gonzaga University and I've lived in California for a long time. I've spent time in uh, Oregon, but I've only circled around it. I really haven't ever lived there, but you'll see a lot of kind of Montana focus um, because I've just done so much work there. But I think what we learn in Montana is pretty broadly applicable to many other parts of the West and the Northwest. So this is a very recent study that looked at, at who's moving to Montana communities and why. Um, the author of the primary author of the study, Tara Mastel, and I were talking the other day, and she summarized it this way. She said, basically, there are three buckets of people moving or, or general general buckets and they're about even. There are about a third of the people were moving back home, about a third were moving for a job, and about a third were moving for a better quality of life, um, including to find less congested place to live. So the top five reasons across all of those buckets for moving where they moved was because they wanted a desirable or more desirable natural environment, which was also translated into better access to the outdoors. Going back to that kind of focus on outdoor recreation, that's not really surprising. Um, so over 60% of the people that were surveyed identified that as an important value for them and where they live. So going back to this idea that um, jobs are following people, this kind of, this desire, these desires can fuel what's called entrepreneurial migration, which is people moving to a place even though they don't have a job. They're either going to bring a business with them or they're going to start one while they're there. Um, so the the, um, there's another category, of, there's a subcategory of entrepreneurial migration, which I think is very interesting. It's called travel stimulated entrepreneurial migration. It's basically when you go and visit someplace and then you decide you need to live there. My parents did that when I was in seventh grade and I was so mad at them until I realized that ending up in Northwest Montana was pretty great. Um, so how can you explore this for your own community? Uh, a few different ways you can do that. One is to find locally relevant studies and sort of extrapolate from something that's either about your state or your region, if there's not anything that's specifically about your community. So looking around for studies that kind of shed light on these dynamics in your own community is one way. 
Headwaters Economics has a library of trails benefits that if you haven't used it yet, you will. Um, super useful uh, library of trail benefits and they add studies to it um, as they come up. You can select it by different kinds of benefits that you're interested in. You can select by different types of trail use. You can select by year and you can select by part of the country or region. So that's one way to kind of at least have something that's a little closer to home to talk about. Um, I also like to look at local comprehensive and recreation planning documents because those are all often based on or have a community survey component that can sometimes shed light on what people care about or want to see in your community. Or you can do your own business and resident surveys. You can ask your own questions to explore the local values of trails or protected areas or whatever it is that you're interested in, outdoor recreation more generally. Um, you, or you could do instead of a survey, a more um, in-depth, in-person interviews and, or focus groups. And one of the reasons why that's interesting to me as a strategy is that you don't go in, you don't run the risk of overlaying your sense of value on the sense of value of other people. So even if you're gonna do a business or a resident survey, sometimes it's good to do focus groups or interviews first to learn how people are talking about their values, how people are talking about what's important to them, explore their perceptions, and then you can reflect that in your survey. Um, asking questions is, I mean, it's the only way you're going to learn anything except by observing, which is a question in itself. What am I going to observe? So this slide shows some of the kinds of things that you can learn if you ask questions in your local community. These studies also, so I think a lot of times we like to pull these little, um, little facts or statistics out of studies like this. The other way to use these studies is to read them and to say, how did they ask this question? What questions did they ask? How did they do this survey? So you can get ideas that you can kind of translate to your own place by looking at another study. So if you look at one of these studies and you think, wow, we'd really like to know that about our place and just kind of backward engineer the study to um, fit your place. Uh, I just went back and started forward. So if you need help, there are a couple of resources that I really like. If you feel like, oh, I'd like to do a focus group, have no idea what I'm ta even talking about. I only know that they exist. So the University of Kansas Community Toolbox is a really great resource for learning how to do kind of community processes, including research like focus groups and surveys. It has a ton of other researchy and engagement strategy ideas like photo voice that I think are really interesting. So this is a really great resource. And I do not want you to overlook your local or county extension or the extension agents who are at your um, kind of work at Oregon State University, for those of you who are from Oregon, whoever, wherever your main land grant university is. So both at the county level, but also at that state university level, Cooperative Extension has a lot of resources to offer. Even if it's just, hey, we want to learn more about X. Do you have any ideas about that? Um, they're a really good place to start for some kind of hands-on support. The second kind of economic value that I want to talk about or a community benefit is community health. So trails contributing to community health. And again, research suggests that there is kind of a predictable relationship between access to trails and other outdoor recreation facilities and levels of physical activity. So there's a little bit of if you build it, they will come. When you talk about trails, if you build them, people will start using them. Not 100% true, we'll talk about that later. Um, but also a predictable relationship between levels of physical activity and overall health, and then healthcare cost reductions over time. So this, um, the benefits of this fall into a couple of baskets in my 
estimation. So first is trail construction can help promote activity among people who don't typically exercise. So it's, there isn't just a restricted population of trail users in your community and that's all you're ever gonna get. Usually new trail construction brings new people out onto trails. And I'll tell you one of the reasons for that in a minute. Um, but interestingly, you can look at this for yourself um, in your own community if whenever you have new trail construction. So you uh, can just do a fairly simple survey about trail users and ask about levels of activity before the trail was uh, built and then after. And it's very interesting also to ask, do these trail users, these new trail users exercise in other places? Why do they use the trail? So this is a good example of a study that can help you figure out how to ask those kinds of questions in your community. But if you wanna do something that's more ambitious, so you wanna connect trails to physical activity to cost savings in your community, I'm gonna outline a way to do that. So we did this study um, with a whole coalition of organizations in Cameron County, Texas, which is very South Texas the very southern part of Texas, so around Brownsville, Texas. And what we found is in that study is that people who live near trails, I'll define that in a minute, um, exercise 22% more than those who don't. And we were able to work from that bit of information and insight to project um, healthcare cost savings due to increased physical activity uh, over time from completing this new network of proposed multiple use trails. So this is the public report of that study. Um, and it, I'm gonna, I'll put up my email address at the end of this and I'll also put it in the chat. And if you're interested in seeing the technical document that goes through the steps of this um, health and physical activity impact analysis, I'm pretty sure I can find that. Um, so um, there are basically three steps to do that. One is you have to connect increased physical activity with proximity to trails. So there, you can do that one of two ways. You can look at studies from other places that talk about the increase of physical activity, or if you have a kind of a long-term health data or kind of health status cohort in your area or in your community specifically, you can use those data. Uh, we were lucky enough in Brownsville that the School of Public Health had been collecting uh, health data from the same people over time for many, many years. And so we were able to look at people who lived within a quarter, a quarter mile of a new multiple use trail before and after this trail went in, but we were also just being able to look at how much more reported moderate physical activity people who live close to a trail get than, than those who don't live close to a trail. And that's a quarter mile in a city. Um, or rural areas, it's a little bit further out than a quarter mile. So um, then we just connected physical activity to better health and to cost savings. And the way that we did that was we looked at peer-reviewed studies that estimated the healthcare costs from physical activity on an annual basis. And then we thought of those as potentially avoided costs. So if people were healthier because they were more physically active, then we could avoid at least some of these healthcare costs. And so we just projected that 22% increase in physical activity um, across this whole network to, and we used census block data around all of these red trails on here. So all these red lines are the proposed multi-use trails in this network. We only use those because we had data about multi-use trails. And so, so we just calculated this kind of 
um, marginal increase in the amount of physical activity. And we linked that back to the healthcare cost savings that we got from those peer reviewed studies to come up with our data. So it's a fairly, I mean, there are three steps to the analysis, you know, grab a, grab somebody who works with data, grab a GIS person, and you, know, you can kind of knock through this yourself. Um, but if you feel like you need help, I would go and find your nearest school of public health to see if they've got this kind of health cohort data that shows you levels of physical activity. Um, you might be able to grab a graduate student or a faculty person to help you out with your analysis and also local and county health departments. If you are interested more generally at looking at studies about health benefits of trails, Headwaters Economics, that trail library um, is a good place to start. If you're going to go to other places to look for relevant studies, these are three things that I've learned along the way that make um, studies from other places more digestible or acceptable to community members. So one is um, that you pick studies from situations that are similar to yours. You pick data sources that if you have the choice are closer to home rather than further away. And you make sure that they have the data that you're missing. So those things can kind of help you home in on studies that are gonna uh, maybe ring some bells and make some people in your community say, oh yeah, I could see why, how this might be happening here. Uh, or yeah, that analysis really makes sense to me. The third category of community benefit that I wanna talk about is local business growth and success. So. Um, there is a lot of research out there into, broadly speaking, the economic impact of trails, but there is less research out of, that's out there that specifically looks at how trails and trail networks influence the business locations decisions, influence business expansion, influence new business formation. So some of this is, you can just do this through you know, the old uh, observation method. There is a little bit of research out there that connects these dots. Um, you can see this phenomenon, especially in, in communities that have specifically decided to try to connect trails and business development or trails and economic development. So trail town programs, bike friendly businesses programs, that sort of thing will all kind of um, highlight the connection between trails and businesses and kind of sensitize both community members and trail advocates and the business community to the potential economic role. And also to just open your eyes and make you think, hey, those are questions that we should be asking. So long distance trails and kind of larger trail networks are the most studied in part because we, because there's firepower to study them. And we also know that they're gonna yield the biggest effects. So researchers are gonna go where they're gonna be able to see a clear effect. And then organizations like um, the Progress Fund that started the original Trail Town program on the Great Allegheny Passage will do their commission, their own economic impact reports. And they'll do that over time. And so for example, we know that on the gap, um, from 2007 to 2015, that 137 new trail-related businesses opened in these towns along the trail. Um, there were also some business closures during the time. So over that course of eight years, there was a net gain of 65 new businesses and 270 new jobs. Um, multiple businesses expanded operations, some of them sold. Um, when you ask business owners to estimate the percentage of sales related to trail traffic, that um, kind of predictably went up over time. And I think in their current economic impact report, I've seen this, I just couldn't find it when I was looking for it now, 
um, that that percentage is even higher for these kind of trail oriented businesses. And so you can look, um, this study is really great to mine if you're trying to think about ways to look at questions to ask about your business community, about business growth related with your trails. The study is great to mine for that. Um, and I would suggest just sitting down with it and a cup of coffee and like circling things. This is interesting, this is interesting. Smaller trails and networks also yield um, business benefits, but you probably have to dig for them a little bit more. So this is a coffee and bike shop in Brownsville, Texas. It started as a pop-up on the weekends at a trailhead in the park. And it was just a single trailhead just for this one multi-use multi path, but setting up there really convinced the owner that it was worth looking for a location that was close to the trail. Um, so the only way that you learn about most of these stories is to do your own snooping around locally. In other words, ask. So earlier I said that there was a little bit of an if you build it, they will come um, aspect to trail use, but that only sort of works. So if you are focused on business growth, you really want to you you really want to focus on it. If that's important to you, you're going to need to act to make it happen. Quick story about Perry, New York. It's um, there's a pretty new. I think it started within the last year and a half. Trail Town Initiative in the Genesee Valley in Western New York. So this is. Genesee Valley, this is Rochester, this is, these are Great Lakes up here, um, Finger Lakes over here, New York City off the map. Um, and so Perry's positioning is, uh, there's this big state park there and they call themselves the main street for the state park. But it's really taken a lot of um, focus to grow into that description. So they first focused for a few years on downtown improvement, including this really interesting community investment model that they used. And so then they were really ready to focus on business growth once they had kind of brought more retail or more business spaces online. So what they focused on was in part driven by the results of a visitor survey where they asked visitors, you know, what needs to be improved? And visitors told them, first, you need to be open when we're there. Second, more local food. Third, show us where to walk and bike. Fourth, more cultural events. And fifth, you really need to work on your accommodations. And so as it as Perry tried to figure out, you know, what businesses do we want to populate our downtown, they really took some of this advice to heart. And so since 2017, um, there are four restaurants or drinking establishments that are sort of local food oriented, um, the pizza place being the least um, of them. There's a bunch of new kind of deluxe Airbnb accommodations um, some specialty retail that's specifically related either to the ag um, culture of the community or the outdoor uh, kind of outdoor recreation connections. But how it happened was not just that these businesses just decided that they wanted to be there. There was a lot of recruiting, a lot of kind of personal relationship building, making sure that the communities of entrepreneurs and business owners that already was downtown was being really welcoming. Um, local government and business leaders played a role. There was a lot of matching entrepreneurs to spaces and a lot of trying to connect entrepreneurs with business support and encouragement. So this kind of stuff is possible. You just sort of need to focus on it. But it is also possible to have business benefits sort of sneak up from you, sneak up on you. So last month, I think I talked to John Cohen, who is the chamber president in Ottawa, Kansas. And Ottawa, Kansas sits at the intersection of two pretty major rail trails, but they have not thought about themselves as a trail community. I mean, it just wasn't baked in just because those trails existed there. So they started really focusing on in-town trails. And their first question was, how can we get people in Ottawa outside and exercising more? So building in-town trails, 
You know, the first one went under a highway to ball fields. Um, and then they just started kind of connecting more parts of town with trails. And then they started asking, how can we get more families to spend time on trails? So they invested in developing pocket parks that were each one a little different and kids and families could pick to go to different pocket parks. And then they kind of realized, well, what about older kids who don't like hanging out with their parents? So they made a teen park that was close to the trails. And then they started building out their trail network so that it connected more parts of their community. And over the course of doing that, what they found is that they had turned themselves into a trail town and that they have businesses that are specifically locating where they're locating because of the trails. So saying, how can we get a piece of the action? So not surprisingly, one of them's a bike shop, one of them's a brewery, but also a car dealership, a hotel, and something on the order of 14 Airbnbs and bed and breakfasts that primarily serve trail users. So they came to this uh, business development through a focus on serving their own community, not a focus on serving visitors. And now they're saying, what else do we need to do to serve visitors? So these kind of business benefits can, you know, can aggregate out of a local focus about visitors. And I know, you know, I just, I know that visitors are touchy in a lot of communities that I've worked with. Some places are just like enough, just make them go away. But on many trails, and I'd say on most trails, local users outnumber visitors by a long shot. But it's the, that fraction of out of the area visitors that yields that economic impact. So thinking about um, kind of keeping an open mind when you talk when you're thinking about visitors and what role they play in your community. And one question to ask, so in Whitefish, um, there is this just sort of overall disgust with visitors because during the summer, locals would say it's really, you can't turn left ever in Whitefish. And so, because the traffic is so bad, and they kind of blamed the Convention and Visitors Bureau, but it had been years and years since the Convention and Visitors Bureau had promoted summer visitation to Whitefish. And there was a lot else going on in Whitefish than just visitors. There were a lot of part-time residents, a lot of people with second homes and third homes and fourth homes there, people coming back for the summer, local people coming to Whitefish. So, um, so just kind of keeping an open mind and not thinking you know what's going on until you actually have established it. So if you want to explore kind of how trails and their impact on local business, business play out in your own community, here are a few ways to do that. Ask business owners. You can ask them simple questions, kind of go back to some of those surveys and think about questions that you want to know from business owners. Um, get ideas from the GAP economic impact studies. My favorite way, so a lot of times if you ask a business owner, unless they have a really directly trail focused business, they will often not know. So I like to actually recruit business owners as eyes and ears and recruit a bunch of them, allies within the business community to just start asking their customers and guests some questions, not six questions, one or two questions, and then come back have an informal conversation with them about what you're learning, what they're learning, what you're learning together, what your next questions are. And one thing that that does is it gives you reach to um, hear from your visitors without surveying them. And it also helps business owners see that whether they're local or out of town people, that trail users might be a bigger and trail use might be a bigger part of their business than they had recognized. You could also track specific downtown or business district changes, especially if you're tracking alongside things that you're doing with your trails. If you're doing better signage or better promotion or you know, better connecting, let's say you have a network of mountain biking trails that's out of town and you're connecting them better to in town with some kiosks or some things on your website. Um, 
And now you're starting to see some kind of parallel changes in the downtown businesses, then you can um, at least correlate those things, even if you can't talk about causation. You can track various indicators of municipal health, and you could also do a downtown and market or downtown market or business district analysis, which you could do for a variety of reasons, including to demonstrate that downtown or the business district has value. Um, if you want to do that, this is this really great do-it-yourself tool. It's not a small task. If you need help, here are a few places to go. Main Street groups, municipal officials, chambers of commerce, back to the Kansas Community Toolbox, back to the Headwaters Economics um, Trail Library. I do not want to talk about this. So my last slide, other benefits of trails for local communities. These are things that you might think about um, trying to document and talk about if you don't already. Transportation, kind of the appearance of safety, maybe of an old rail corridor or some other areas along the trail. How have those changed with trail development, festivals and events, community engagement. So I've seen in most places there are a lot of trail user groups um, that are disconnected from each other. Uh, is there a way to kind of bring your forces together? Green space and connectivity, uh, cultural and historic preservation. Another thing I would throw in here, maybe under community engagement, is the value of volunteer effort to maintain trails that has a ton of value. That's essentially a contribution of the community to itself. So these are, this is such a thin layer of how to talk about economic value. Um, and they pulled most of this content from some courses that we teach online um, that are really do-it-yourself courses. These are designed to give trail advocacy organizations, community and economic development people tools to do your job. So got one coming up in June that's um, do-it-yourself trail user research. Um, we've got one about uh, community and economic development around outdoor recreation. And we've got one that's specifically kind of taking what we did today, adding economic impact to it and diving in a lot deeper about how you uh, understand and um, substantiate the benefits of your trails and also conserve lands. Um, so 15% discount with this code Oregon Trails stuff, we can email that out afterwards. And I do want to invite you, um, you know, if you've got something that's really specifically on your mind, something that you want to explore more, just shoot me an email. Let's find a time to talk. Um, and I, I can um, put my email address in the chat too. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other and just uh, see what kind of questions we have hanging out. Right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions in the chat so far, and so we'll start with those, but um, folks are also welcome to just raise a hand at this point um, to let us know you have a question that you want to share directly. Um, but I wanted to start with more of a, a clarification question um, that came in right after you were talking about the health benefits and healthcare cost savings. Um, and this question from Amy Camp is, you mentioned kind of the phrase marginal savings and wanting to know if that means that you took a conservative approach with the projections. So Amy, thanks for busting me on talking in economist speak. Um, <laughs> so we did take a conservative approach to our projections, but what I mean by marginal is, so like there'll be a base of physical activity and then you build a trail in the neighborhood. So what's on top of what already exists? That's the marginal benefit. And um, a question from Aaron that I know is uh, top of mind in a lot of Oregon communities these days. Um, and he says, for lots of rural communities, things like multimodal pathways are a non-starter due to the poor reputation of pathways in other areas that bring about illegal dispersed camping, perceptions of crime, et cetera. 
how would you tackle that conversation to help address those fears? So Erin, are you with us? Um, Cause I wanna ask a question back to you first. This is this between landowner objections, like just no, we don't want that. <laughs> we don't really care, we don't want it. And then these sort of legitimate concerns about what's gonna come along with trail development. I think these are some of the trickiest aspects. And I wanna also open this up to see if anybody else has thoughts about this. But Erin, I wanted to ask a question back to you, which is, um, do you know of, or can you think of places that have a different experience with these pathways? I think we could probably cite different pathways. Um, it's just the ones that tend to be kind of closer to like neighboring that rural area are the ones that I think the residents see the most of. And so that's what they associate them with. Um, I just wonder about, you know, maybe we cite a multimodal pathway up in Washington that's successful. How does that still kind of change their mind about something that's happening in their area? or that's happening kind of, you know, next door to their community. Right. I think it's still, I think it would still be the issue, yeah. Right, and, and understandably so. So I, I wanna, I know that there are other people with expertise in this on this call, but the one, one way that I would recommend approaching this is to, um, maybe try, yes, use these other examples, but not just to say, look, it can work, but to interrogate them, to ask what is it about how they managed or develop or use or um, patrol or you know, <laughs> construct or you know, what is it about these places where they work that we could consider adopting here as we do these pathways for ourselves so that it's not just a dueling well it you know it was a terrible idea over here and that's really close to home and then you're going to try to fly in with some other places and some other examples and say yeah but it doesn't always work out like that i think that the path is a conversation about what would it take but I'm curious if anybody else has thoughts about that. Um, Jack, do you have a response to this question? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, <clears throat> because uh, we work with a lot of small communities in Southern Oregon, uh, I think that um, a, a bad experience may be exposing an existing underlying problem in the community. And um, uh, the trail uh, system just maybe makes it more visible. So in the interrogation that you talked about, I think is the first step in the right direction to determine what's really going on and to the, what extent is it a pre-existing community problem that needs to be dealt with? Yeah, that's interesting. I know this is a potentially juicy topic right here, but I'd also love to go to Shannon's classroom and find out what the question or thought there is. Hi, uh, yeah, um, we're calling in from Eastern Oregon University here, um, and it actually dovetails off of, of this topic, but one of the things I've noticed, I'm relatively new to Eastern Oregon and um, in my conversations with some folks in city planning or parks and rec or you know what have you about about trails specifically but you know park improvements and and whatnot uh, i hear um a lot of concern that like if we make improvements we are going to turn into bend or boise or missoula and there seems to be um a bit of like well we'd rather have dilapidated playgrounds or um, sidewalks that don't go anywhere, like that just like end or, you know, uh, um, the beginning of a trail, but then not the finishing of a trail because of fear that our community will be too great. And like what you were just saying about whitefish, you know, go out of control. And I just wonder about um, some of your suggestions and resources for showing that, you know, with 
good city planning, these things can, you can, like, as you were saying, the, the, the amazing things about the communities can really be highlighted and um, showcased, but in a more controlled way. And that some forms of, of recreation and tourism can be really good, but as you noted, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? So I was just curious about some of the strategies that you've employed that have been successful to kind of help get over that hump. So you guys are asking all the really hard questions. Um, because there's a certain part of this that's just like I'll go back to whitefish as an example. So that that idea that the convention and business visitors bureau ruined whitefish by marketing whitefish, like just completely ignored all of this complexity, like cheap money for a really long time and people from Texas buying houses in Whitefish. And, you know, so there, and that's not the Convention and Visitors Bureau saying come to Whitefish and, you know, spend a week. That's like people following word of mouth to find those good places to live. So I think two things occur to me. And then again, I'd like to hear from other people. One is I'm a really big, proponent of learning from your peers, learning from places that you think have done something that would be, so not learning from Missoula, if that's what's scary to you, but like looking around and saying, well, what are communities that are good places to live that haven't just gone over the top of you know, whatever it is that scares us. So is it population growth? Is it, you know, like we can't afford to live there? Is it, what is it that's really frightening us? Um, I think of the other thing though, I'm not sure what to do with the self-sabotage. I think that's sort of what you're saying is that we'd prefer to just be kind of junky, like not make ourselves better in certain ways to stave off any kind of popularity. Is that, well, that's I, is that right? Yeah, that's, that certainly seems to be one like piece of the puzzle. And some people are just saying, we don't, we don't need to change. Like everything is fine um, to like push back. Like, oh, if we put bathrooms at the park, then that's going to require more cleaning. So we can't do that. You know, like, I don't know, like a real, um, deflated balloon attitude, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm really big on, um, other than like learning from your peers, it's like little projects that you can agree on. Like what are those little, I don't know if you're familiar with strategic doing or the idea friendly model, sort of these um, very bite-sized, um, and I wrote, sort of low hanging fruit, what, what kinds of things that would be beneficial to our community can we agree to do? And so like some places might agree that, well, we already have the start of the trail um, and we might think it's a good idea to, to have the school build a butterfly garden next to the trail. So you're gonna pay attention to the trail without doing that kind of scary piece of now we're trying to make it a 50 mile trail and you know bring a lot of visitors here but i wonder if there's something that if there are some projects that might help can i add to that yeah have any of you ever heard of the phrase tactical urbanism well i've used that for trails in my tiny southern town um, and when I've got a 14 acre forest preserve, a little time in the back of uh, my neighborhood. And boy, when we talked about putting a trail in there, you'd have thought we were mowing down the whole forest. And uh, so I simply went out and a couple volunteers and we put in a trail and I happened to live near to the mayor and the uh, then city manager. And they're like, what have you done? I said, just come for a walk. And if you don't like it, it'll grow over in three months. Well, a year later, they were looking at how do we put formal trails? How can we build bridges? And it was kind of like 
overcoming, giving them a chance of saying, this is a temporary thing, let's try it out. And I've done that with pollinator gardens, pollinator meadows, uh, trails, with the whole idea being, you, know, you can go back to the way you were before if you want, but let's just try it. And maybe, you know, in the playground scenario, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's new plant um, paint. Maybe it's putting a pollinator garden near the, you know, sprucing it up that way near the playground. Um, Maybe there is one piece of equipment that might, you know, and see, oh, that didn't hurt. We could try some other things. But it's just a suggestion and approach that um, the town I live in when we started doing this was only about 6,000 people. We're now up to 15,000, but it's not because of the trail. Because <laughs> <laughs> we annexed in another city, a little town. <laughs> but it's definitely, um, you know, some. I had to take baby steps, a lot of baby steps. And um, we're, we're getting a lot of support as, as a result. So just throwing that out, an idea. Thanks, Shixi. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that approach that she just talked about? Tactical urbanism. Thank you. Yeah, it's often often used in the, the street context of, of people putting in a temporary bike lane using barricades or temporary street seating using barricades or kind of using, it's often used um, and kind of a using movable structures on the street grid is often where I think of that coming from. But I got a city, I got a whole entire section of the front lawn in front of city hall transformed into a pollinator garden because I just kept assuring parks, we can mow it down and put grass back if you want. <laughs> so, but you know, they saw all the volunteers and they went from being eh, and now they're all excited about it and they're promoting it. So it's, yeah, it's just, pushing the edges of the envelope a little at a time. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge that we're, we're a little bit past one o'clock. Um, if, if Michelle has a few more minutes, we can, can leave it open for any final questions. But I did want to make sure for anyone who has to leave soon, um, both that I expressed our gratitude to Michelle for presenting today and for you all for coming um, and let folks know that we will send out an email on Monday when the recording is posted on the blog and I'll also go through and try to pull pull the links um, that were shared today so you can access those easily and directly as well. I have a question. Yes. Um, recently, um, we work closely, we're a nonprofit that works closely with um, a state park in Texas. And um, recently, a, uh, one of the small towns that borders the uh, trail had a developer who bought property and um, was developing it as two acre plots. Um, and you could have two horses and they were gonna have direct trail access. Well, I will say the developer kind of got the cart before the horse, didn't check all that out. And um, anyway, he contacted our organization because there was a meeting. The state park actually leases the property around the lake from the Corps of Engineers. So there was a meeting with the Corps of Engineers and the state park. And the request made by the developer was to have a, um, a small trailhead access directly out of out of the development and he was willing to maintain the trail going up to where the you know it entered the park and so on so um but we really hit the slam door um and it had a lot to do with um no they don't want another access point they don't want to have to keep up with it you know, we knew that they would probably be concerned about users getting on without paying, but we had already suggested that there could be a self-pay kiosk there, um, which they have at other uh, trailheads along this. Um, the total trail is a 26-mile linear trail along the lake. So I'm, uh, but the answer was like, definitely no. And, um, but I would like to see us go back, especially after looking at what is some of the benefits because um, our trail association and we're equestrians, we're interested in it because it would give us a more direct access to town. And what we'd like to do is ride the trail, go in, eat lunch and, um, you know, then get back on the trail. And um, 
if we go up to the next trailhead, the next established trailhead, it's another three miles. And I tried to point out to them, you know, it'd be a lot easier for us to ride in a mile from this particular area rather than going up three miles farther up and then having to ride three miles back, you know, after we eat. The, the city was very supportive um, because they have already uh, wanted to put in hitching rails for our horses. And um, so they're, and they want to keep the old Western atmosphere in this small town. But I'm just wondering, is there some data or where should I be looking for data as to the upkeep maybe of a trailhead, of establishing a trailhead? I mean, all they were looking for was another access point. It's not, um, it wouldn't be one where there was a lot of parking or, I mean, and it's just to, you know, either you get on by walking or you get on by horseback out of that community, but it wouldn't be one where you pull in with uh, trailers and all of that. So I'm open to any suggestions. Um, we were just surprised at how adamant they were um, about not having another uh, trailhead. Well, the state park probably is, <laughs> is your best <laughs> source, but they're probably not gonna wanna cough up the information that you want, given that they just don't even wanna to talk to you about it, right? Yeah. So, um, although this, I would look to see if rail, if American Trails or rail trail, Rails to Trails Conservancy has any information like that. I have a, the Nature Conservancy years ago put together not that many years ago, but um, what they call a long-term stewardship calculator, which might be overkill for what you're looking at, but I'd be happy to email it to you and you can look and just see if there's something in there that might be helpful. Um, and does Do other people have ideas about that? Because typically parks and rec departments are probably also might be pretty good about how much it would cost to actually maintain the trail. So if the city's interested, you might, or the trailhead, you might ask the city parks and rec to weigh in on that. Okay. Anybody have other ideas for that? How much maintenance is really needed for the trail? I mean, very little. I mean, you know, as far as I can see, um, you know, it was, there was a portion of it coming out of the, um, the subdivision that went through a small um, floodplain. And, you know, that was discussed and that the developer knew that he would have to um, figure out drainage and things like that. And and the developer was very willing um, to do it. Um, he tried to remain positive, although you could see how frustrated he was. Um, because, you know, for he had really already advertised these sites as, you know, hey, you don't have to trail your horse anywhere. You can get right on here, you know, at this access point, which, you know, I mean, I've dealt with the park and the core for a number of years, and I knew right away, oh, um, you know, this should have been asked way ahead of time. Uh, you know, they were already building houses and stuff, you know, there. Would it be an opportunity? Could your nonprofit say that you would take, you would manage the trailhead maintenance for X number of period? And again, going back to my earlier idea, it's so simple as far as development goes that you said, we'll try it for a year. And yeah. at the end of that year, if you feel you powers that be feel this is still a bad idea, then it just goes back the way it was. Well, and that, you know, that's, that was one of the things I was thinking about when you were talking about that, because there's no reason why if it didn't work out that they couldn't just close the access. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I was very surprised at is there is already a precedent for this. Farther down the trail, there is another um, sub development, and they do pay a fee to the park. My understanding is that I think they pay $2,000 to the park um, on an annual basis and they have um, a requirement that any of their users have to have an annual pass, you know. But um, I mean, the developer was willing to, to do that as well, you know, but we were still hitting the brick wall. Um, so I think 
I think you might also just, and so just stepping back from this particular case and looking more broadly, one of the reasons that I like, um, so the, the idea that I put out there about engaging the business community and helping gather information for you is one of the reasons that I like that is because you want the business, you want businesses on your side. And there's not a single business community, but you know, you want businesses on your side. And one way, it's a lot of years ago when I lived in Washington, DC, I think Chris Matthews had put out his book, Hardball. And one of his suggestions was, if you want somebody to support you over time, ask them to do you a favor. And then basically they have bought into you, right? They've started to invest in you. And this is, it's a super simple way. Hey, do us a favor. We're curious about, and then, you know, for the businesses, we're curious about these two things. Like how many people, how many horseback riders or how many trail users or how many, whatever, you know, come into your store or where they're from, where are they from? And so you get, then they start, understanding for themselves that these are good questions for them to be asking for their own business. So you're asking them to do you a favor, but they're investing and investing themselves in it. And I just, I think that I mean, maybe part of the conversation that you want to be having is also a sort of a, a, a turn away from this direct question of that specific trailhead and talking in the community more about the city wants to keep the old west flavor of the community and they're thinking about hitching posts and, and so instead of bicycle friendly community what does it look like to be a horse friendly community right and and then amy can talk about this so amy's done a lot of work with trail communities and her thing with some places like the idea of connecting your community to like a bicycle trail, like put a bike on it, she'll say, right? So put a horse in your window or put a saddle on your thing or, you know, the little ways that individually, and I think this goes to Tixie, what something that you were saying, like we can take these small steps and they add up and they turn out to not be that painful, right? So you can put a saddle in your window for a while and if you don't like it, you can take it out, right? You're not making a giant commitment to it. So maybe, maybe this is kind of an invitation for you to be having a different kind of conversation about vision and, you know, how your equestrian community and the city and the business community can work together if you're not already having that in a way that both builds support for the kinds of things that you're trying to accomplish with that specific trailhead in the state park but also broadens your base of allies so that you can maybe be having some different conversations that are more anticipatory with the state park. Like, oh, this came up, but we already know that this trail is a really great resource for the city in part because horses use it. So let's talk about that. Yeah. It's good for the city, it's good for the state. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think the surprising thing is we live in um, the county in Texas that has the most number of horses per capita of any county in Texas. And in Texas has the most number of horses per capita of any state in the union. So, um, you know, I mean, it's not like, I mean, it's a big horse community area. So... Anybody else want to get in here? I think we did it, Steph. All right, great. I did just- Talk until um, everybody is completely speechless. I did put your email address uh, that you shared earlier in the chat if anyone wants to grab that out of the, copy and paste that out of the chat before we close the meeting. Um, and yeah, big thanks to everyone for joining us today and especially to Michelle for the presentation. Um, we will share links and a webinar recording uh, beginning of next week.
um, if you want to return, revisit anything or, or pass it on to others. So and I'm also happy just to share the slides so that separate from the webinar, you don't have to dig through the whole webinar to go, there was that one slide about X, right? So I'll just send you a PDF of the slides to staff and you can post those. Great. We will be happy to do that. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And Thank thanks you. for the work y'all are doing on, on bringing trails to our communities. Really grateful for it. Thank you for your sharing your expertise as well, both of you. Take care. Yes, okay. thank you. Thanks, Very everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.